Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, it's great to be here. This is going to be a great conference. I'm so excited about this. Um, like, like Katrina said, I, I've been an ed tech leader for a long time, so I really feel like I am kind of an expert in educational technology. I'm not really an expert in change. I, uh, I don't have a degree in change management or anything, um, but I am a lifelong learner, and I've done a lot of change projects in technology, uh, like a lot, I'm sure a lot of you have. I, I try to learn because not all of them are successful. So when I have a setback or a failure, I try to learn from it. And another thing that I do uh, is I read a lot. And I've been reading a lot about change lately. Um, especially, I've been reading about behavioral economics and psychology, kind of how people's minds work. And these are some of the books that I've found really helpful. Um, Dan Pink's When, um, Misbehaving, which uh, Richard Thaler just won the Nobel Prize for Economics. It's, it's a really good book. And then Thomas Friedman, who I've, I've really liked his work for a long time, and he's got this book called Thank You for Being Late, which is about change, and it's also about the future of technology. I recommend all of these books. I'm going to share all my slides with you, and all of the research that I cite has links to the original research. And a lot of this research, it's actually pretty accessible. Uh, I'm not a psychologist, but uh, you read through it. Some of these things, they're the really cool studies that they did that help you understand how people's minds work. Um, and, um, and I think by understanding the people that we're working with, uh, you can help make change more effective. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about why the case for change is so important. And I know we're all in this room because we signed up to go to a conference about change, so you don't need me to tell you that change is important. But, but I, I want to give you this graph. This is an idea that's by uh, Astro Teller, which, first of all, Astro is a really cool name. Uh, he is the captain of moonshots for Google's Project X. And captain of moonshots is about the coolest title that you could imagine. Uh, so this is a guy who works at Google doing moonshots every day. And the way he explains it, is that technology has been changing over time at this kind of exponential pace. And maybe a 1,000 years ago, you might have had the same technology that your parents had. Um, there might have been a change that happened in a city that takes 100 years to get out to the countryside. Um, and then, you know, over time, the pace of change gets faster and faster. And the good thing is, human adaptability has also been getting faster. We've been getting better and better at handling change. Uh, but the pace of technology change is exponential, and the pace of human adaptability is linear. And the real challenge facing us is that we just passed that line. So uh, I don't know. This is not a graph with, uh, with units on it. It's more of a concept. I don't know when we, when we crossed the line. I don't know if that was in the late 1800s, or if it was in the late 60s, or if it was in 2015. But the way that Astro Teller describes it is that it's, this is why we feel out of control, that this pace of change, uh, it's just more than we can handle right now. And I think, and it's, I'm... I'm going to make a bold statement that I might be embarrassed by five or 10 years from now, but I think that getting us all more adaptable and more comfortable with change is the number one most pressing problem facing society right now. Um, I think that we can bend that line. We can get ourselves higher. We can, we can become more comfortable. We can increase our adaptability. Um, and I think we have to. And the reason I say it's important is because it, it's not just about the latest iPhone. Is this is about uh, the environment. Like we're producing more carbon now. We have technologies that can ruin the planet faster and faster, and we are not changing our behaviors fast enough to account for it. But it's also uh, the technologies are going faster than government. So we have self-driving cars but we don't have the laws or the traffic lights that can handle what's going to be happening on our roads when we all have self-driving cars. Uh, you, we saw this in Tokyo with Airbnb. Airbnb changed the way that, that um, hotels and, and places to stay, changed the way that worked, and the, the, the Japanese government couldn't handle it, so they just made it against the law and uh, canceled everybody's stay, right? which, which is really disruptive if you have uh, a, a reservation at an Airbnb. 
So, but like governments aren't changing fast enough to handle the way that technology is changing. So, um, so that's big, right? Um, uh, for me to say that that changing changing human adaptability is uh, is the most important thing. That's big. Um, one of the things is we are preparing our students for a rapidly changing world, and so I think that getting them to increase their changeability is also super important. And it's going to be, uh, if, if you think about how we feel out of control right now, uh, in, in 20 years, when our kids are older, if, if we aren't more adaptable, that pace of change is going to be even worse than it is right now. Uh, it's going to feel more out of control. So, um, we are now 19 years into the 21st century, and remember when we did the 21st century skills and it was a big deal a while ago? So we've gotten really good, I think, at schools at doing creativity and communication and collaboration and critical thinking. And I think that we need to put changeability in as the fifth C. I think that we need to make sure that every one of our kids is comfortable with change and is adaptable. Um, and uh, and I, th I think we need to focus on this. Uh, I also think we need to have change as part of our school's missions. I think that, um, that your school's mission needs to have something about preparing students for the pace of change in a rapidly changing technological world, something along those lines. Um, one of the things that we overlook sometimes is that teachers are already agents of change because, uh, by definition, learning is a change in the brain. And so if, uh, if your school has a definition of learning, you should make sure the word change is in it. Uh, every day when a student learns, they are making a change in their brain and the teacher is helping being an agent of change. So we should encourage teachers about that and make sure that they know that, that they're already agents of change. Um, so, okay, so it's, it's a big deal to say that all of human society needs to improve. Uh, we, uh, our, our, most of us, I think, are, are tech people. We're, we work in schools. Uh, we can't change governments, but we can, we can help the next generation by changing our kids. Uh, and also, we technology sort of people, tech directors and tech coordinators and ITC people, and even, even teachers who use technology a lot, we're a little bit higher already on that um, changeability scale than uh, a history teacher who's two years away from retirement. And not knocking history teachers, there's nothing wrong with being uh, two years away from retirement, but uh, if you are trying to have a change project that affects your entire school, it's, a, it's hard when not everybody is at the same level. When, when you're really ready for a change and some of the new teachers who just got in, who are, who are comfortable with technology, they're ready for change, and you've got kind of a wide variety at your school, it makes it hard. So I've done some research. Uh, I have some, I'm not gonna call them tips. These are not life hacks. These are not like quick wins. This is more like understanding how people think so that you can make change more effective. Uh, first, I want to I wanna address this kind of idea that schools are notoriously averse to change. Um, we kind of think of it as, as turning a cruise ship around, like a school, schools and teachers and faculties, they just don't like change. And I think that's a statement we say a lot. And, and I'm going to say, I'm going to push back a little bit um, by giving you an example. There's a middle school principal at my school who was new last year. And uh, in one of her very first faculty meetings, and I was there in the meeting and I witnessed this, um, she, she proposed a change to the report card process. And, and it was an honest proposal. It wasn't like a dictate. It was, this was just, um, she said, hey, I have this idea. What do you think? Raise your hands. Um, and you know that report cards are very important in schools, and the process and the workflow is very important, and you don't change this lightly. But she said, you know, you're doing four report cards a year with comments and, and grades. Um, what if we just did two instead, just at the semesters, and then in between, you could, you know, you could send an email to the parents if you needed to communicate, and um, yeah, what if, what if we just made that change? Who would, who would be on board with that? And, and so, this is a huge change, and almost everybody raised their hand, uh, because in their head, they did the math, right? They're like, um, yeah, the, half as much work? Sign me up. So, so schools can change, 
right? It's just that, that sometimes change is hard, and most of the time change is hard, so, so why is that? And one of the things that makes change hard is this psychological phenomenon called loss aversion. And I'm going to show you some of the research by Kahneman and Tversky. These are the guys that did a lot of the pioneering work in the 70s and 80s on loss aversion. This is the idea that um, we're weighing the pros and cons in our head all the time. And when those teachers um, thought about the report card, they weighed, like, what are they gaining and what are they losing? They're going to gain a lot of time, because it takes forever to do report cards, and doing it, you know, so they're going to get all that time back. Um, they're going to lose the ability to communicate simultaneously with every single parent. But because they can communicate more effectively with the handful that they really need to address, that's actually a gain. So they, they weigh the math in their heads, and they say, yeah, this is good for me. I like this. And, and so here's the real catch with loss aversion. We do that math all the time in our heads, and we are really bad at it. We, we as humans, we've only recently been doing math in our heads, um, but we've got tens of thousands of years of not getting killed by predators. Um, and so, like, uh, some of this research, which is cool, it's actually been replicated in primates. Like, there are, there are psychological phenomena that we suffer from that also monkeys will, will show. So, th this is the weird thing about loss aversion. People just really don't want to lose. Um, they really like to gain. They don't like to lose. That makes sense. The thing is, we can't calculate gains and losses. This graph, this comes from the 1979. There's a link to this article if you want to read it. Most, what I think is really cool about scientific research these days, almost all of these, you can get a PDF online that you used to have to get from the library from a, 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 an official scientific journal. Like almost all of this, you can just read it. So these guys did this math and uh, it's replicated a bunch of different ways. You give people a little bit of money, uh, you take away some money, you give them a marshmallow, you give them a coffee cup, whatever, and then you, you count it up and you ask them how happy they are. Um, it's, it's a really cool study. It, uh, a lot of it is done on um, male college freshmen taking psychology classes, so there, you know, you, you, it's replicable, but you have to consider that. Anyway. So they measure this thing called value, which economists also call utility, but it's basically happiness. And you give some people some gains, and what you find is that they like gains. And so this is not surprising. But the surprising thing is that it's this, it's this curve. Um, people like $10, people like $100 more, but the difference between 100 and 110 is not as much as the difference between 0 and 10. Right, so there's this diminishing uh, value as the gain gets bigger. And the other weird thing is that it's not about, the way they say this, it's not about the change, it's not about the level, it's about the change. So if you make a lot of money, and you drink a lot of coffee, and someone gives you a Starbucks card, you would think rationally, you should say, this is a statistically insignificant gift, um, given how much value this has. But instead, you say, wow, free coffee, awesome. And that's because you went from not having free coffee to, to having free coffee. And so that, that change in, in level is what makes you happy. Uh, it's kind of the same thing when you, you're in a room that's a little bit too warm or a little bit too cold, but you don't really notice. But when you walk from one to the other, you really feel it, because you feel that rapid change. So that's kind of this, this curve that they measured this, this curve. Here's the weird thing, right? People hate losses, that makes sense, but they hate losses about twice as much as they like gains. So a $100 loss should hurt exactly as much as a $100 gain helps, but it doesn't, it hurts twice as much. And yeah, replicated over and over, it's, it's almost uh, an equal curve, this, this S-shaped curve. Um, so if you think about it, if you were playing a slot machine and you kept winning $5 and losing $5 and you did it all night, you should mathematically feel kind of even. You win and you lose and you win and you lose and then you go home. Um, but because that $5 loss 
hurts like the equivalent of $10, you do this, and then, like, even if you just break even, mentally, you've been hurt. And this is why in casinos, they have bells and ringers to emphasize the wins. But when you lose, when you lose a video game that can go like wah, 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 when you lose at a slot machine, it never does that. It never reminds you that there was a loss. There are psychologists who, st who work at casinos and they know how this stuff works. So yeah, so you gotta think about this. Um, this, this S-shaped curve, it has uh, the way that, that Richard Thaler says, a lot of wisdom in one change. Life is in terms of changes. There's diminishing sensitivity to gains and losses, and losses sting more than changes feel good. So if you do a bunch of changes, and it's all even, all the pros and cons even out, you might in your head say, yeah, everything is a wash, but everybody at your school is feeling an overall, um, an overall loss, you have to make your changes have a net two times more positive just to break even. That's hard. Um, so, and that's just loss aversion. There's also this thing called endowment effect. And this is the idea that people like what they have even if they only had it for a few minutes. And there's, there's some cool research that's been done. Uh, again, Kahneman and Tversky, but also Richard Thaler, they did some research on this. And the way they do this, they give people, uh, half the people get coffee cups and half the people get a ballpoint pen. And then they hold it in your hand for a little while. And then you offer to buy it back or to trade for a pen. But um, the value of having a coffee cup um, is much more than the worth it would be to get a coffee cup. This, this thing that once you hold it in your hand and you have it, you like it so much, it's worth more than if it was just an option. It makes no sense at all. It's a completely ridiculous thing. Uh, it shouldn't be that way, and, and it is, and it's replicable. And if, you, uh, if you've been a tech person in charge of software evaluations for very long, you've seen this, um, this new pricing model, um, and there used to be a time when someone would say, we need quiz software, and then you would evaluate some quiz software, and you would find one that was good, and then you would help everybody use it. And now, teachers sign up for a free account, they tell their friends, they all sign up for a free account, and then you get an email that says, oh, there's 20 of us with a free account, and now it's telling us that we can't upgrade, so can we buy a site license, and then, up and you're like, oh, wait, I, we didn't even know about this, everybody's using this. Um, and if you were to say, oh, actually, um, no, you can't have that, well, they have this endowment effect, right? They, just the fact that they've been using the free trial means that they like it, even if it's not very good. Uh, and luckily, some of these are really good, and I think it's great that, that, that uh, teachers are finding software that they like, and I tend to support these things, but it is really hard to kind of turn, turn that back once somebody has tried something out. There's also this thing called the sunk cost bias. And this is where, and this is another one of those things that doesn't make any sense, it's not rational, it shouldn't be this way, it's not mathematical. Um, I have a pair of shoes, this is, uh, this is the shoes that I have in my closet. They are um, cap toe black dress shoes. They were really expensive. They're painful and they're heavy and they're, they are, uh, they're not soft at all. And I've worn them one time, and it was a long time ago. And I'm never going to wear them again. Uh, even when I think about wearing them, even when I try them on, it reminds me that they hurt, and then I put them back. I should get rid of them. They t I, I, should, I should buy new shoes and use the space in my closet that these things take up and put comfortable shoes in that space. And I'm not going to because they were so expensive that I can't get rid of them. And that doesn't make any sense, but we do it all the time. Um, and, and especially we do this in schools. If you are on the committee that does the new mission and values, and somebody on that committee has been at the school for a while, and they say, oh, man, we put so much time into writing that mission. And 
yeah, they did, but if it's time to write a new mission, it's time to do that work, and you can't let that sunk cost of all the time we put into it be the factor that tells you that we're not going to do the new thing. It doesn't mean you have to mean about it. You don't, you don't say, well, this mission sucks, and all your work was, was stupid. Um, you know, you have to embrace that. So these three things, they work together to make change more difficult in schools than it would be if we were all totally mathematically reasonable. Um, I'm going to share an example, um, and it's funny, Adam and Archer and I were talking about switching to Gmail this morning. Uh, a lot of you have probably done this. Switching from Outlook to Gmail, uh, it's, a, it's a technically really easy change to make. It's, um, uh, there's, there's people that can help you with it. You can do it on your own. Uh, it's, it's easy. When I did this, uh, and it was a while ago, but um, I did the pros and cons. I calculated it all up. We were running an exchange server on campus, and so we were going to have secure off-site backup. We weren't going to have servers anymore. Somebody else was going to take care of it all. We actually, you could only check your mail on campus. Right? We had a system in place that only worked when you were at school, um, and we were going to be able to have email anywhere, which just sounds stupid now that there was even a time that you couldn't check your email from home, but okay, we were going to do that. We were giving Microsoft $30,000 a year, and we were going to switch to Gmail, which is free. So we're going to save a huge pile of money. And we were going to get everything from the G Suite, the, all the collaborative editing, all the Google Docs. Um, and unlimited storage. We used to send an email to people that says, your inbox is almost full. You have to delete your attachments. Um, and we were going to not have to do that anymore. A and we had a bunch of teachers who had Gmail for their personal accounts anyway. And so it's going to be the same interface. You already know it. It's better than Outlook. So no brainer. There's no downside. And this one person, and she wasn't a teacher. She was a non-teaching staff member. But she said to me, you mean I'm going to have to stare at this ugly white screen all day? And I'm like, well, that's OK. Yes, but that's the only loss. This is, there's, there's almost zero downside. Um, and also, the, uh, Outlook is not an attractive interface. Uh, Google has really good graphic designers, and it's a superior platform. In almost any way, Google Calendar is better than Outlook Calendar. And actually, this was a while ago, so it looked more like this. It wasn't quite as pretty as it is today. Um, but she, she really loved her Outlook Calendar. And um, she was really opposed to this. And it took me a while to figure out, um, after I've been doing all this research, I, f I realized she's got all this stuff going on in her head. She, she, it's not just that she's losing that familiar blue color. Right? But she has this endowment effect. If we had been switching from, uh, from Gmail to first class or from, from first class to Outlook, whatever, it would have been the same thing. It was the switch. It was the loss, the endowment effect of having that thing she's familiar with. But she's also got a loss in the time it's going to take to learn a new system. And it, in my opinion at the time, calendar is very intuitive. Uh, they all work pretty much the same way. It's not that much time to learn, but to her, it was going to be an investment of time. She had invested, she had a sunk cost in all the time that she put into knowing exactly how to add a calendar event, and now she has to learn all that over again. So she's losing a lot of time. Um, and she also had this feeling that there were going to be other losses. She, she didn't know exactly what it was, but she knows that there are things that you can't do in Google Calendar. And her example was overlaying two people's calendars at the same time when you're trying to find out what time the meeting is. She, she knows it's not the same. Um, and so she was just worried about that loss. So when she did the math in her head, she didn't care about the on-site backup. She wasn't in charge of the servers. She didn't want to do her email from home. She wasn't paying the budget. Um, she wasn't using collaborative documents anyway. She wasn't a teacher. She wasn't interested in, in, in sharing a Google Doc with anybody. She didn't have a lot of storage. She never had to worry about it. And in fact, I think she kind of would like it if she had to every now and then tidy up and delete her attachments. Um, and she didn't have Gmail at home, so it wasn't a familiar interface. So none of my gains matched hers, and all of her losses were bad. So she thought this was the worst decision ever in the school. And um, so you have to remember when you make a, a change that every change is a loss to someone. 
So I think about her a lot. I, I think when I'm about to make a technological change, when I'm about to make a new project, who are the people who are gonna be really hurt the most? What's going on in their head? What are they thinking? How can I reach out to them and mitigate their loss? How can I figure out how to make sure that they appreciate the gains? And you know, communicating those gains, that's a big part of it. Um, and, oh, that $30,000, um, I always just thought of that as just a, uh, a nice benefit to the software budget. But I have a new idea, so a teacher at my school uh, came up with this idea. What if I had taken some of that 30000 and bought everybody Starbucks, right? To say, hey, we're switching, we're saving money, here's some coffee. I never would have thought of that on my own. Um, I'm going to call this the, um, the Becky uh, Technology Dividend, uh, name it after her. We just, um, I don't know if you use lynda.com, it's great, I love lynda.com. We had accounts for all of our students in middle school and high school, and they could use it to learn uh, it's video learning software, it's really great. And LinkedIn bought them, and now it's only available to adults. LinkedIn doesn't want anybody under 16 using it, so we have to cancel the account, which is a drag, and there's nothing we can do about it. But it costs us 7,500 US a year, so I'm gonna take a little bit of that money, and I go through all of the analytics and figure out which teachers have been using it, and I'm gonna give them all Starbucks cards and say, uh, yeah, sorry about this, it's not a, nothing we can do, but this is gonna help a little bit. I think that's kind of fun. Anyway, every change you make is a loss to someone. And the more you can build a case for change, the, the less of a hurt it'll be. Uh, so, two more cool things that come out of psychological research. So this thing called hindsight bias, this is really pernicious. This is the thing where, in retrospect, it was obvious. Uh, you propose a change, everybody thinks it's a good idea, and then the parents all hate it, and everybody says to you, well, of course the parents hate it, what were you thinking? Um, th my example on this one is we changed learning management systems. And we had a bunch of teachers design the rubric, um, what are we trying to do? We did focus groups, like what do we not like about our current LMS? What do we want in the new one? And they want, they want it to be easy, and they want it to be, uh, um, they want to have photos in it, they want to have the kids' photos, they want to have a grade book. They want it to support standards-based grading. Well, they had a, a, a pretty good list, and we used that rubric to evaluate a bunch of systems. Uh, we landed on one. We are using it for a while. And in, about three months in, uh, somebody says, you mean you can't put bullet points in a comment? That's ridiculous. And they're like, who, who, who approved this? Like, bullet points in a comment was never one of the original things on the rubric. We weren't even thinking about bullet points in a comment. See? But you have to have kind of thick skin about that and say, I know that people are going to, in retrospect, think it was a bad decision. So you can do whatever you can to, to try to think it forward and to try to make sure that you've covered all your bases, but people are going to think that. The really horrible thing about hindsight bias is that we all do it. Um, and we don't recognize it in ourselves. So other people do it to us, and it hurts, and then we do it to other people and we don't know we're doing it. And um, I think that trying to build a culture where we recognize that this exists, just be aware of yourself and not attack people for making a change that nobody could have seen coming. I think we should get past this hindsight bias. Also, it helps, mm, it hurts, it hinders. Um, when you are trying to learn from your mistakes and you feel like you should have seen it coming, you're not quite as self-reflective. It makes it harder to be reflective if, you, if you're letting hindsight bias cloud your judgment. So, it, but it's hard because it's built into our brains and it's difficult. Um, this one, this is, this is one of my favorites. This, if you have a chance to read the Wikipedia article on hyperbolic discounting, it's fun. Um, there is this idea, this is, this is the thing that explains why rapidity of change is, is a big deal. Why, why, things, um, why things hurt more when they go fast. Because time is more valuable now than it is in the future. 
Uh, an hour on Monday is a lot more valuable than an hour on Monday in a month. And that doesn't make any sense because an hour should just be the same value. Um, but these, uh, O'Donohue and Rabin, they did this, um, they call it the beta delta model. It, they can measure, like they ask a question, would you rather have a dollar now or three dollars tomorrow? Uh, and most people would rather have a dollar now. But if I say, do you want a dollar uh, in a month or three dollars in 32 days, they'll take three dollars because they can wait another day that far away. So by asking those questions, you can actually measure, and there's a hyperbolic function where you can actually put a value on time. It, it's weird and it's kind of complicated, but, but it's cool. The idea is that you can buy people's time at a discount if you buy it far enough in the future. Um, and then by the time the, it comes due, it's already on their calendar, they're, they're stuck with it, you, you've purchased a valuable chunk of time, but you've done it in advance and, and you get to pocket the savings. It's, it's a weird thing. Um, here's uh, the way that I use this in schools. There is a, there's a, um, there's a feeling that you get that you need to wait until something is perfect to share it. So you might, if you've got a two year long tech project, you're gonna switch student information systems or whatever, and you're working on it, you might put your head down and work really hard for 18 months, and then once it's ready to share out, then you send it to everybody, but then they only have six months to wrap their head around it. If you start the clock ticking at the very beginning, then you're buying their time two years from now, and you're saying, uh, hey, this thing's coming, we don't know how it's going to work. We want your input. Here's a survey. What do you think about the current system? Do you have any advice? They all know this is coming, and you say this is coming in two years, and then you send out reminders along the way. It's the same project, but because you're buying the time down the road, the, the rapidity is a lot less, and the hurt is a lot less, and people don't mind it as much. It's, it, it, yeah. it builds the case for communication. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. I don't know how funny it is, but I'll tell you a story anyway. Um, actually, that was probably funnier than the story is going to be. Um, I sent an email out about a change that was coming uh, in 13 months. And a, the teacher caught me in the hallway, and they said, oh, I just got your email. This is, this is happening in February? And I said, oh, yeah, but it's February next year. He said, oh, my God, thank you. Oh, good, because February is so busy around here. Yeah, you get it. It's, it's going to be busy next year, too. But he has now he's got a year to wrap his head around it. It's not going to hurt so much. So it's, it's the exact same change. It just, uh, just time in the future is cheap. Um, so, so you have to build the case for change. That helps people get the gains and losses right in their heads. And you have to communicate it. And I think one of the best ways to communicate a change is through data. And I'm a, a, a kind of a data nerd. I really love charts. I like graphs. I like data. Um, and um, I think if you are not really comfortable with data, it should be your next PD uh, goal. I think that there are some really good edX classes. There's some lynda.com classes. If, um, uh, if you go to the board or to a team of uh, leadership team with a change and you say, uh, you know, all the teachers are saying we kind of need this thing, or a lot of parents have been saying, like, a, a good school board will say, oh, really, a lot of parents? Uh, what, what's the number? Give me a number. Make a graph. So if you can go to them with actual hardcore survey data, you build a case for change a lot more effectively. Um, and Google Forms makes it very easy to do a survey and then get a graph that is very bad. It's automatic. It's, it's super easy. What I love about it is you get that information. You can quickly see what it is, but don't ever just share out the, the built-in um, survey pie charts that come out of your Google surveys. Um, uh, if you haven't ever heard of Edward Tufte, if you are a school leader or a tech person and you need to build a case for change, um, this, his, Edward Tufte is the, the world's leading data guy. I love this guy. He's awesome. He's super smart. He does these one-day um, 
workshops on data visualization, and he does them in the summer uh, all over the U.S., and they're, they're affordable classes. Um, and when you get it, you know, first, it's going to be the best one-day PD that you've ever had, but also you get to keep all of his books, and, um, and yeah, it, it's great. And his books are awesome. Um, so if you're putting ink on a chart, it all needs to be intentional. Like the color purple here for strongly rec what does purple mean for recommend? That has no, nothing to do with recommend. And a neutral is orange. Like this doesn't make any sense. And you can't use a pie chart to compare different questions. So when I was talking about the learning management system, and I'm not saying this is the world's greatest chart either, but um, we had student feedback survey results. And I used a stacked bar graph with colors so that green is agree and red is disagree. And we can quickly see that there's something going on with homework that needs digging into. Uh, either the kids want more homework or they disagree that there isn't too much homework or there's something happening, but the homework is different from everything else. But we narrowed in on this 15%. And on a pie chart, 15% doesn't look huge, but this is the, the most of the disagreements of all the other questions, is kids say they don't understand how they're being graded. And so we had a learning management system that wasn't designed to help you understand how you're being graded. And that, so what we've learned is, when we do our LMS evaluation, figuring out how it helps kids understand how they're being graded, that's an important part of it. Uh, and we also, in a different survey, found out that kids don't feel like they belong, that, that they, um, there's this disconnect between adults and kids at the school, and 43% feel like they belong, uh, which is not enough. And it, compared, to, um, compared to other schools who do the same survey through Panorama, uh, this was a problem. We identified it as a problem. It's not necessarily uh, fixed by the LMS. We had a big social-emotional um, push and the counselors were involved and we improved the advisory program and uh, we changed our mission. It was, we did a lot of work to address this issue that kids don't feel like they belong. Um, but uh, making sure that our LMS helped kids understand how they're being graded and also helped them feel like they belong, that was important. Uh, I also think it's important to find the person in the data because we ask this you know, how connected do you feel? And here we get 51 kids who say, not at all. And what you could do is say, eh, the green's pretty strong. I don't know, it's, it's, that's pretty good, good enough. Uh, and it, it, actually, what's really funny is when we, we counted this up, initially, we scored it as the percentage of kids who were positive. Um, and the leadership team, the first time they saw it, they said, can we also include the neutral in that? And like, because they want the number to be bigger, right? Like, like that's cheating to kind of say like, oh yeah, it's more than half, like don't disagree. Um, anyway, but the thing is that really, that really bothers me is that there's 51 kids who say not at all connected. So who are they? Like how do we have focus groups and talk to the kids and figure out for those 51 kids, what's going on in their life? What's, what's happening? I really think that in addition to uh, a graph, you have to tell a human story. I, I really like this quote. I'll give you a chance to read it. It's the idea of the difference between a statistical life and an identified human life. And so when we were making our graphs, when you're telling the board, like, this percentage do this and this percentage do that, what you can do is find the human in it. I'm going to give you an example of, of, uh, of the way that graphs can do this. I took the data from the US Department of Mines Safety and Health Administration. Um, and so from 1900 to 2017, the number of deaths per year in coal mines has come down a lot. Back in 1907, it was the most dangerous year for coal mining. Like, over 3,000 people died in coal mines. And the population's grown up, so you could actually make this graph look better by saying, like, uh, as a percentage of the population. But, but this is really good, right? We've come a long way in making mines safer. And when you've got a group of people that you're trying to motivate, 
if, if there's a lot of work to do and the motivation is really low, you can focus on what's been done and you can say, look, we've come from 3,000 and it's really doing good, so go team. And that can help motivate people. But when your team is already motivated and you want to focus on the work ahead, what you should do is zoom in on the work that's remaining. And so what I really like about the, the Mine Safety and Health Administration is that they, act, so they do focus on the work remaining. On the graph on their website, it's this. This is just from 1978 to 2014. So they're looking at, and this is an improvement. The, the mines are safer now, but they, you don't see in this, there's still 35 Americans every year dining in coal mines. Like that 35 people every year on average are dying uh, in a coal mine, and the Mine Health and Safety Administration, they say, like, this is work to be done. Uh, there have been laws passed, there's better technology, there's better safety. Um, things are improving, but uh, there's work to be done. Now, here's the thing about telling a statistical life. Uh, um, I don't know how much work is currently being done on those average of 35 a year. Um, if we were to try to do a public fundraising campaign to save those 35 people, I don't know how effective it would be. Um, but do you remember in 2010 when those 33 Chilean miners were trapped um, and the world watched for months and, and this was a big deal and all of these people became celebrities. We were watching them on TV. Um, the, the world spent $20 million to rescue. Every one of them survived at the cost of $20 million, and a lot of that came from private contributions, people who donated money to save them. Um, but with those, uh, and then it's in that same year, uh, that's the little spike there. There were over 50 Americans died in coal mines, and, and we don't even really know who they are. So when you are using data, also remember to tell a human story. Um, I had some good survey data when we decided to switch uh, from BlackBod to Veracross. The nice thing about switching away from BlackBod is no matter what you do, it's better. So, yeah, so you can't lose. But um, I had a lot of good survey data, data from other schools, people who were happy with Veracross, but we had an assistant, uh, we had a, an ITC uh, who had become an assistant principal in Budapest, and I knew that they were using Veracross, so I asked her, and then she asked some of her students, and I used this slide in part of my presentation to the leadership team about what Tracy Reed said. She asked, four te she asked all of the teachers, she got four quotes back, and she says, I like it more than any other tool I've used. And that, having that person that we all know and trust, having her name on that quote was a really effective part of building that communication and about building that change. Uh, this, is, this is the thing, um, uh, if you can build a case for change, you can move away from the status quo. And this is a really interesting thing about the status quo. Um, this is a research that was done on parole hearings. So there's, uh, this is over 1,200 cases that are being tried at a uh, parole board in Israel. There's eight different judges, and every day people come to them uh, and say, please let me out of jail. And the, the default position would be no, go back to jail. The change would be, yes, you've made a good case, we set you free. And so these judges uh, sit in this courtroom and listen to these cases all day and make decisions. So these researchers um, took all of this data and analyzed it. It's, it's actually not by time of day, but it's pretty close to time of day. It's ordinal position, so, so you got the first case of the day and then the second case. Um, and, and you can see that the first case or two of the day, there's about a 65% chance that they say, yes, you can go free. And then the day winds on until 10.30 or 11, at which point there is a 0% chance that they say you go free. Then they go have a snack break and they have a sandwich and a piece of fruit and they walk around a little bit, come back after their break, uh, back up to 65%. So if you are the prisoner who gets stuck with the 10.30 slot, you don't, like, it doesn't even matter, you're, you're not getting free. Um, so, but if you were right after lunch, awesome, like coin toss. 
So this is, this is horrible, but, and the researchers don't exactly know, right? Is it, is it the caffeine? Is it the glucose level of your brain? Is it exercise? Um, who knows? But I'll tell you this, I would love to do this research. I bet if you are a school where the leadership team meets at 8.30 or 9 o'clock in the morning, you have more effective change than if your leadership team meets at 4 o'clock. Um, and if you have to have a meeting at 4 o'clock, have donuts and coffee and a little break to move around because, yeah, the status quo is the default position. And when our brains are in that afternoon or right before lunch or whatever it is that this research did, that that's, that's, uh, that's the change. Um, so I think that we can uh, rearrange our schedule knowing this and, um, and make it more effective. There's also, this is really cool research that came from Connie Gersick. She studied a bunch of different teams and they, she found this consistent thing called the midpoint slump. That, that uh, teams start off with a, a project and when she studied them, different groups, different people, um, it could be um, a month-long project or a 90-minute project or a year-long project. They start off with a kickoff, they get to this slump, then they ramp back up for the deadline. And what she found was that there was a concentrated surge of activity right at the temporal midpoint. And so what I do now when I'm planning a change project is I check the calendar and I figure out when the temporal midpoint is gonna be so that I can be there to make sure that we, that we take advantage of that spark, right? The problem is at schools, the slump in a year-long project happens at winter break. Uh, and with a two-year-long project, it happens at summer vacation. And so both with our Veracross implementation and when we were planning for Learning 2, when I went on the calendar and I said, when's that spark going to happen? When's that concentrated activity? We weren't in school. Um, so uh, you don't get that. So what, what I think you should do, if you can break your project up into slump clumps, you have two discrete mini projects each with a deadline, and then you break at summer or Christmas, then you have two different concentrated temporal midpoints, and when you do that, you'll have a whole lot more total activity, and you also get to rest your brain a little bit more over the break. One of the things that Richard Thaler says is that we learn through frequent practice and immediate feedback. And so this is the thing with economics. We get really good at buying avocados and bananas. We know when they're ripe. We know when they're overpriced because we do it a lot. But we almost never buy a house and we almost never buy a mattress. So we don't know anything about that. And so when you go into a real estate agency or a mattress store, you're kind of at the mercy of somebody who's telling you how much things cost and you're not an expert. Well, I think this is the same thing with schools. People think we're really good with technology because we can answer questions about Google Docs file sharing. And we do that every day, but we don't, um, we don't migrate email systems very often. So we're not experts at these big changes, and, uh, and so we don't have enough practice at it. But what I love about conferences like this is that I know that in the room, no matter what project I'm working on, there's going to be somebody here who's done it before, and I can learn from them, I can reach out to them, and I can, I can learn from their practice. So I hope that in the next two days, whatever it is that you're working on, you'll be able to connect with somebody in this room, and together we can all become agents of change. Thank you.